I'm Michael Hudson. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Peking University. My focus is on uh, the distinction between the financial economy and uh, the real economy at large. I treat the financial sector and debt as an economic overhead, and my focus is on how society can deal with the debt and to explain why society cannot recover from the current depression until it uh, writes down the debts to what can be paid. Michael, we're uh, almost a decade on since 2008, and we sit here now uh, in the developed West, and we look at the global economy. Um, to um, even an untrained eye, things aren't still right, or, or, and haven't been right for some time. Where are we, and what's your view on why we're here? Well, we're in a permanent uh, debt deflation, to make it very brief. People think uh, uh, in terms of business cycles as if uh, whenever things go down they automatically recover, but every business recovery since World War II has taken place with a higher level of debt, higher and higher and higher. And finally, by 2008, uh, the volume of debt was so high that it was absorbing all of the economic growth, and uh, at that point, the stock markets plunged, uh, especially when it became apparent that the business plan of the large banks was economic fraud, junk mortgages. Uh, people say, uh, when Queen Elizabeth asked, why didn't anybody foresee it? The fact is, everybody foresaw that there was a crash. That's why they used the word junk mortgage. That's why they coined the term ninja, no income, no job, no assets. So all of the terminology uh, was widely used. The FBI in 2004 explained that there was the largest wave of financial bank fraud in history and uh, uh, George Bush uh, shifted uh, the investigators out of the FBI into national security so nothing was done. Uh, when President Obama ran for election he promised to write down mortgage debts to the real value of property not the junk mortgages in excess of the value, and uh, that he was going to, uh, the terms that Congress set for the uh, bailout of the banks, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, was that uh, banks would rewrite the mortgages so that uh, the homeowners who uh, could not pay would pay exactly what the rental value of their property was. And what, hap what happened? In practice, nothing was done. Uh, Tim Geithner, uh, who was a protege of uh, Robert Rubin, uh, was moved uh, as, on behalf of Citibank as uh, treasury, and uh, he bailed out the banks, leaving uh, all the debts in place, not writing them down. And uh, the problem there is if you don't write down the debts, then uh, banks stopped lending mortgages. They called in their credit card loans. Uh, credit card exposure in America went down by about $100 billion, uh, from $1 trillion to about $900 trillion. Uh, the mortgages uh, were re written off. Uh, and so people uh, had to pay so much money to pay off the debts that uh, had been built up during the uh, bubble economy that they didn't have enough money to buy goods and services. And the result was that in 2008, uh, the banks were saved, not the economy. So you, make, you make a distinction between the real economy and Wall Street or the, or the financialized economy. Um, and when you say that the debt has built up since World War II, uh, you know, um, year on year, what you're, is what you're saying that when, you can, when the real economy can no longer service that debt, that is when we have a financial crisis. That's when you have a crisis. And, and it, so it isn't a black swan as such. It, it it's, is actually it's the, inevitable. It, it's, uh, the magic of compound interest uh, means just that interest rates grow uh, and accumulate, uh, plus new money creation, uh, grow faster than the economy grows. So here's the situation. So, uh, by 2008, uh, and it remains the case today, debt in almost every country is equal to the entire GDP, the entire national income. Now, if uh, debt is equal and the interest rate on debt that people have to pay is 4%, this means that if economies only grow at 1 or 2%, if they're growing today, all of the economic growth has to be to pay the financial sector. On what, interest payments? On interest alone. 
not mentioning the repayments of principal uh, to pay down the debt. So uh, this is uh, the phenomenon of debt deflation that uh, was discussed already in the 1930s. Uh, it's a, it's a, a phenomenon and it's inherent in the very mathematics of compound interest. In fact, this should be the focus of the economic curriculum. What? If you're teaching economics, you should begin with the relationship between finance and the economy, between the buildup of debt and the ability to pay. That should be the starting point if you realize that the problem of our time is how can society cope with the debt buildup the, that has occurred and is keeping the economy from recovering. So people listening to that must think, well, God, that is the obvious place to start. Why, don't, why doesn't every undergrad economics course start with that? Why doesn't it? Well, I taught money and banking at the New School uh, for social research in the 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, they wanted to uh, essentially teach uh, the Chicago School monetarism that uh, treats the whole economy as if it's barter. If you look at almost any economic textbook, all the way through the PhD, they treat the ec economy as being barter, and then they factor in money creation as if money creation uh, d directly affects uh, prices. Well, uh, th this kind of tunnel vision led to uh, th the following situation. To, it led, the people called the bubble economy the great moderation. And it was the great moderation because somehow uh, the banks were able to lend homeowners and companies and governments enough money to pay the interest. And uh, it, it, there was actually the largest increase in money creation in history since 2008 with no increase in price at all. So all the money creation has gone to buy stocks and bonds into the financial sector. So just let's define the great moderation. Which years would you put the great moderation between? Uh, about uh, 1995 to 2008. And it was a great moderation. And Greenspan explained it. He said it was moderate because labor didn't complain, because productivity was soaring and wage rates did not go up in the American economy. And he explained this because of what, uh, before the Senate committee, uh, by what he called the traumatized worker effect. He said, uh, workers are so deeply in debt that they're afraid to strike. They're afraid to complain about working conditions because they could be uh, walked out the door. But he and also if, you, if they are fired, if, if they don't have a job, then all of a sudden the interest rates they pay on their credit cards go up to 29%. They're one month away from insolvency, one month away from homelessness. So Greenspan said, we've, we've hooked them, we've got them. And his view is that's the optimum state for workers. Why? Yeah, they can be because controlled. that's what he calls a free market. A free market is where the 1% get to smash the 99% without any ability of the 99% to fight back. A free market is where people do what they're told. And a free market is a mar the opposite of what Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and everybody else meant by a free market. Mm -hmm. The classical e economists meant a market free from rentiers, free from landlords, free from banks, where everybody got what they deserved and produced. To, uh, but under Greenspan and modern economics, a market is free from government regulation, uh, free from throwing the bankers in jail when they commit crime, uh, free from uh, any kind of uh, policy making uh, by government, by labor unions, uh, by society, and uh, a, a, sh uh, it's a, a free market today is a centrally planned economy, but it's not planned by government. The planning sh is shifted out of government into the banks. So and Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street here in the, in the city in London. There can be no bigger failure as we sit here when you look at the actions of central bankers, when you come to talking about the real economy. Um, where next for them? Uh, it's very hard uh, to take people who have a tunnel vision and expand it because uh, they're just like uh, the old time Stalinists or religious sectarians. Uh, their minds are absolutely set, uh, set. There's no way you can have a reasonable argument uh, with the Federal Reserve because they know who appoints them and who appoints them are the, the, the Wall Street uh, institutions. They're drawn uh, from uh, the Wall Street institutions and uh, uh, it's the financial system sector that endows the universities, endows the business schools, and hardly by surpri uh, surprise uh, these schools teach that there's no such thing as unearned income, no exploitation, that the financial sector is the most 
productive leading sector in the economy instead of uh, a burden that should actually be subtracted from GDP because it's an overhead uh, that the rest of the economy has to pay. There, uh, this was basic classical economics of uh, Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill. They all looked at what the landlords got uh, and uh, the banks got is uh, socially unnecessary overhead. The economy could function technologically without a landlord class, without a banking class, uh, and yet uh, there was a political malformation of markets. Mm. Well, market economists take the status quo for granted. They assume uh, the market is what exists, and it's as if it occurred naturally through some kind of Darwinian evolution, and as Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative. Right, so That's the central bank theory. There is no alternative to us serving uh, our clientele, the private banks. Right, so let me suggest that there is an alternative. And what, let me um, get your thoughts on this, because this Tina idea has run its course, and people are now starting to wake up and say enough. Um, and really, if you want a, a, an area to focus your attention, you, I know you've written a lot about this, it's about unearned versus earned wealth. Unearned wealth or unearned increment, if you like. And it goes back to a man called John Bates Clark. Uh, John Bates Clark was the, one of the first neoclassical economists, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and just talk a little bit about him, because a, a, a seemingly innocuous shift, because he said there was no differentiation, is that right? Yes. And that seemingly innocuous um, proclam proclamation has had huge effects. By the 1870s and 80s, there was a lot of pressure uh, in all countries, but especially in the United States, uh, by socialists on the one hand and uh, followers of the journalist uh, Henry George on the other, wanting to uh, tax away uh, the economic rent and use that as the tax base instead of taxing labor and uh, industry. And so John Bates Clark uh, wrote uh, about the philosophy of wealth and he said, there's no such thing as unearned income. Everything that the economists before me have written is uh, wrong. Uh, we, uh, uh, everybody earns exactly what they contribute to national product. And that means that whatever their earnings are will be added to uh, national product. Now, I'll give you an example of where this leads. Uh, about two years ago, uh, the head of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, said that uh, Goldman Sachs managers were the most productive people in the American economy because they earned $22 million a year in salary not counting their stock bonuses. Now, and he said, all of this 22 million we get is added to GDP. So how, uh, and uh, if productivity is uh, value uh, received for labor, and by, if by definition, everything you pay to Goldman Sachs is in addition to GDP, instead of a subtraction from it, then we are the most productive. This is the, this is the tradition that John Bates Clark uh, started. And uh, he, No wonder he got funded. Yeah, well, he got so well applauded by the bankers and the landlords and the fire sector that uh, the American Economic Association uh, established the John Bates Clark Award for economists under 40 years old who were writing in this uh, anti-classical tradition that they call neoclassical to uh, erase the uh, fact that uh, they were the exact opposites of uh, classical uh, economics. Wow, wow. And that medal or that award? It goes to free enterprise uh, right-wing economists uh, to legitimize. There's been uh, a, a pretense that the only legitimate economists are people with a tunnel vision who say it's okay to give Wall Street whatever it wants. You shouldn't regulate uh, prices. You should not throw the bankers in jail. You shouldn't even regulate consumer protection because that's added paperwork and it only adds to consumer prices. Uh, you really, if you get rid of government, everybody will be happy. And uh, the one percent uh, trust us. We are the job creators, or is in fact, of course, uh, their job destroyers when they uh, use a leveraged buyout to take out a firm, uh, downsize the labor force, uh, wipe out the pension fund, and uh, outsource the labor to uh, China or wherever. So just so we're totally clear on terminology, can you give us your definition between earned wealth and unearned wealth, or earned income and unearned income? Because people on, on the ground, they know that there's something wrong, but they, they can't define uh, what the problem is. Uh, the classical economists said there were three kinds of unearned income. Land rent, uh, of absentee owners uh, that you have to pay them just because they, their ancestors conquered the land and they established uh, rental claim. Uh, 
monopoly rent uh, by a monopolist and natural resource owners uh, of uh, charging a price that's much more than the cost of production. Uh, and finally, interest and financial charges. Uh, these are unnecessary. We have economies that have the same technology all over the world. So essentially, economic rent is, uh, was the word that the classical economists used for unearned income. And it's the excess of price over the actual cost value. How much do you, does a product, a pharmaceutical for instance, actually cost? And uh, if it costs uh, $2, to make a pharmaceutical pill, and they sell it for $200. Uh, that uh, difference is price over value. And is that called the economic rent? Yeah, that's called monopoly rent, and that's, a form of, that's one of the three forms of economic rent. Unearned income is income that really is paid to an unnecessary class, or who uh, used to be called the idle rich in the 19th century. Hmm. And what did Veblen call them? He term. called them the vested interests. Right. In other, and the vested interests, he said, were the people who actually uh, run society. And uh, they run society by dumbing down economics. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he wrote wonderful books about the uh, decay of uh, education and said education is the ideology of the ruling class. Uh, the purpose of economic education is not to explain how the world works, but to give a vocabulary that basically will confuse people into believing that the world has to be the way it is and that there is no alternative. Uh, instead of thinking, wait a minute, there are other ways of thinking. So the vested interests do not want the history of economic thought taught. When I studied uh, economics and got my PhD, there were still courses in the history of economic thought. All of this has been dropped for mathematics now. So when people uh, talk about Adam Smith on a pedestal or John Stuart Mill, they have no idea that Smith actually was criticizing uh, the rentier sector, the landlords, uh, the monopolists, and uh, the banks. Uh, and, uh, and he's made out to be uh, a prototypical Alan Greenspan, uh, the lobbyist uh, for the banks and for the real estate sector and for the, uh, basically for what's become uh, the criminal class. Where do you see the discipline? Because, I mean, you touched on it earlier, Louis Garricano, Professor Louis Garricano at the LSE, when the Queen asked him, Queen of, uh, you know, she said, but why did no one see it coming? And he couldn't answer the question. E economics is in a, the dismal science couldn't get more dismal than it has. Um, it's a field you've worked in all your life. Where, where do you see it going from here? Well, you can't turn a cold-blooded frog into a warm-blooded mammal by saying, why don't you just warm up the blood? Uh, it takes an entirely different uh, uh, entity. Uh, I don't think ac uh, academic economics can be uh, formed from within uh, because you've locked in the old uh, vested interest. You can't change the thoughts of somebody whose mind is trained into a tunnel vision. Uh, you can have to do what was done a century ago and create a new discipline. Uh, unfortunately, sociology has met the same fate as economics, largely at the hands of the University of Chicago. Uh, so you have to have something, you could call it future studies, you could call it reality economics, uh, but it would be a different discipline. Uh, we still call it economics at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, where I'm a professor. And uh, we, our graduates, however, have great difficulty being hired by other uh, uh, universities because in order to be hired in America, you have to publish articles in refereed journals. And uh, the, the right wing, uh, the monetarists, uh, the libertarians, and the neoliberals, have, uh, through, especially through the Chicago School, have taken over uh, the economic journals and will not let any alternative analysis or views be uh, pushed. And that's the genius of Chicago free market economics. It's the Pinochet principle, that you cannot have a Chicago-style free market unless you're willing to kill or uh, eliminate everybody who disagrees with you. Uh, a free market economics, Chicago style, must be totalitarian. There must be no alternative. And uh, this is what is happening in the, this is how economic education in the United States is. It's a Pinochet without the machine guns. Don't they see the irony in this? No, they see their paychecks. <laughs> where, well, if we take it to its logical conclusion, where does it end? Totalitarianism. Uh, 
It ends uh, with uh, economic planning shifting out of the hands of democratic government into the hands of the central bankers and the treasury who will do to Europe what they've done to Greece, uh, who will do to the United States what they've done to the Baltics, uh, who celebrate austerity and uh, uh, mass immigration and demographic collapse as a miracle instead of an economic disaster and suicide. So you have a, the vocabulary has been twisted around uh, into what really is junk economics. Uh, you have euphemisms, uh, an Orwellian type vocabulary of using words uh, to, that actually mean the opposite. So a free market means the road to debt peonage. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you have Frederick Hayek calling uh, any kind of pr uh, consumer protection or government protection of the economy the road to serfdom instead of the road away from debt peonage. Basically, the uh, market uh, economics is a blame the victim economics. That uh, if you say, well, if, if you don't have a job, if you uh, owe money and can't pay your education debt, uh, that's uh, uh, your fault. You've made the wrong economic decisions. Uh, and if you were smarter, uh, as smart as the uh, Goldman Sachs people, you'd make money. And uh, the rich people are the smart people. And if you're poor, it's because you're dumber than the smart people. That basically is what it's all about intelligence. Well, you don't need intelligence to make money. All you need is greed. And uh, that's not taught in business schools. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street firms, uh, pref uh, when, uh, f already 50 years ago when I was on Wall Street, they said, we want to recruit people either from the Brooklyn slums or the Hong Kong slums. They're the best foreign exchange traders because all they want to do is make money uh, and rise. They're the people uh, that we want. Uh, and uh, that has nothing to do with being smart. It's, it's again, a tunnel vision, a short-termism, and uh, the economy, uh, by living in the short term, is destroying itself in the long term. Let's end on a positive. Where do you see a hopeful scenario? Where do you see change coming from? Uh, because I know you're saying we're locked into this. It's sort of structurally determined, but um, there must be uh, glimmers of hope that you see. Well, in the end, there's only one way of solving the problem, and that's to write down the debts. There's no way the debts can be paid, and the only way of freeing the economy from all of this uh, payments that are uh, paid in debt service to the fi global financial sector uh, is to write down the debts. That's what finally happened uh, in Rome. That was what uh, Jesus' first sermon was all about, uh, wanting to restore the Jubilee year. Uh, uh, well, we know what happened to him. Yes. Uh, that's what uh, finally happened in the 1920s when Germany uh, and the Allies were all pushed into depression from uh, German reparations to the Allies to pay inter uh, Allied debts to the war debts to the United States. Finally, these were all canceled in 1931. So after about a decade of depression, uh, there will be, uh, the people will finally see that the debts have to be written down. Uh, I, but there's not that awareness yet because uh, there's a feeling that money doesn't matter, that debts don't matter, and the economy's really just barter. And uh, unless people think of uh, debt as the whole economy is uh, being wrapped in a context of debt and property ownership and rent extraction, they won't realize it's what's being sucked out of the economy. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be this way. So you're so, saying there is an alternative? Yes, there is an alternative. Flesh out that view. Well, it's the view, really, that uh, classical economics had as reformers. Uh, uh, you. Uh, keep the natural monopolies, and this would include healthcare and pharmaceuticals and water in uh, electricity in the public sector. You'd have a public alternative to provide uh, uh, basic services and basic needs at cost. And the first business professor in the United States, uh, uh, pa uh, Pat Simon Patton, said that uh, government infrastructure is a fourth factor of production alongside labor, land, and capital. That, uh, uh, it, but it doesn't aim at making a profit, unlike uh, uh, private capital. It aims at uh, supplying uh, health care and water. And Facilitating. Pensions. Yes, facil and banking, uh, at either at cost or at a subsidized price or freely. And that's how you make an economy low cost. Uh, and uh, if there is any 
natural rent, and uh, some uh, sites are, uh, land sites are more valuable, you, you use that as a tax base. You tax economic rent, not labor, not uh, industry, uh, basically, you tax the free lunch income. You don't uh, add to the, uh, use a tax system that adds to cost uh, instead of uh, subtracting uh, from costs. And if you approach the economy as a design job and said, this is the economy we want to design, you, the, the social and economic indicators are all going to start to go in the right direction. You'll have a completely different set of indicators. But we are diametrically opposed to that system at the moment. Yes. That's and, correct. And really, because and you've written Killing the Host, which, by the way, is excellent, um, and, 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 and what a contribution. Um, and, and this depicts it, because the yeah. parasite is now labouring, uh, the parasite is now so, so big, the host is labouring so badly under that. Well, the key of parasitism in nature is it's not simply that uh, the parasite takes uh, the lifeblood of the organism. In order to do that, the parasite has to take over the brain. And it takes over the brain of the host to make the brain think that the parasite is actually part of the host's body and even the baby. Uh, and so what you have today is uh, the economy imagines that the financial sector and the Donald Trumps of the world and the real estate speculators are part of the economy and part of GDP instead of being an overhead, a tumor. And you can get rid of the tumor just uh, through proper tax policy and by having a public option as an alternative. Um, if you were going to run, I'd vote for you. I don't think I could get, raise as much money from Wall Street as uh, the uh, other side. Why not? You don't think they'd like this message? Well, <laughs> politics is not about uh, uh, giving a reality. You saw what happened to Bernie Sanders and all of the uh, stuff that's come out from WikiLeaks about how uh, the, uh, the uh, election was fixed against him. The, uh, the delegates that Hillary won uh, at the beginning were all in the South, which are all Republican. So she won the Republican uh, states uh, as her major backers within the uh, Democratic Party. So the, uh, the candidate of the Democratic Party was elected primarily uh, both from uh, operatchiks within the party and by Republicans' uh, states. That's the irony of all of this. People aren't looking at, uh, uh, at this in, from a point of view of systems analysis. Congratulations on Killing the Host. It's Thank an you excellent very much. Um, book. Just finishing the sequel to that in the companion volume, which is J is for Junk Economics. Or tell, I, tell us about it. Plug it. Well, uh, it basically shows how the economic vocabulary is uh, become Orwellian. Uh, and uh, the words that economists use have become the opposite of what they were really meant to be, like free market is the opposite of what Adam Smith meant for a free market. Uh, right down the line, uh, you have uh, junk economics is uh, basically the neoliberalism, the Chicago school. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a fictitious picture of uh, how a hypothetical universe might work if the 1% were really job creators, if they really ran the economy in order uh, for long-term growth instead of in the short term to make money for themselves and take the money and run. So it, it juxtaposes uh, the good economy from the bad economy, reality economics from desert island economics, which is the kind of individualism, asocial, uh, almost autistic economics that passes uh, for economic education today. So you're not surprised that Anne Rand, uh, Greenspan uh, and Anne Rand were good mates and actually she taught him about sociology. You're not surprised about that. Uh, when I went, when I worked on Wall Street uh, for Chase Manhattan, I was actually, uh, he was brought into a study I was doing on the oil industry and uh, Chase was very worried uh, that just his presence on the, the study would uh, degrade it because he was known for saying whatever the employer asked him to, to say. He was a lobbyist already in 1966 when this occurred, so I was given the job of firing Alan Greenspan from the study and removing it uh, because they said, he's such a little bastard, uh, we don't want him to come after us. You know, you're a little guy, you're in your 20s, you know, he doesn't even know who you are. You give him the informa you know, information that we know. He faked the figures, uh, we know where he faked, you found where he, I was given the job of finding where he faked them from uh, and uh, writing it all up in uh, uh, the small print. So uh, when Greenspan re, uh, finally uh, left the Federal Reserve, uh, the BBC had on its, web, on its uh, where you, the screen for that day, uh, after me, 
the deluge. Michael had, they asked me, what do you think of it? And I, after me, the deluge. Uh, he left the economy knowing it w he was jumping ship, uh, just like uh, inv uh, investors are jumping ship uh, uh, today from the economy that they've driven into debt deflation. Thank you very much for this. It's a massive, it's, it's an awesome book. Um, and, uh, and so, but what's coming up is J for Junk Economics. Yes, uh, that'll be out uh, later uh, in December. I'm just going over the proofs now. Uh, and Killing the Host was just is, uh, translated into German uh, in uh, late November by uh, Kletkata Press. It's always nice to shake the hand of a man who's fired Alan Greenspan. Uh -huh. uh, Thank you. This is a badge for uh, a renegade ink badge for people who think differently. Uh -huh. You, uh, along with uh, all of our guests, do, and it's great to have you. Pay off the debts that uh, had been built up during the uh, bubble economy that they didn't have enough money to buy goods and services. And the result was that in 2008, uh, the banks were saved, not the economy. So, you, make, you make a distinction between the real economy and Wall Street or the, or the financialized economy. Um, and when you say that the debt has built up since World War II, uh, you know, um, year on year, what you're, is what you're saying that when, you can, when the real economy can no longer service that debt, that is when we have a financial crisis? That's when you have a crisis. And, and it, so it isn't a black swan as such. It, it it's, is actually it's inevitable. It, it's, uh, the magic of compound interest uh, I means just that interest rates grow uh, and accumulate, uh, plus new money creation, uh, grow faster than the economy grows. So here's the situation. So, uh, by 2008, uh, and it remains the case today, debt in almost every country is equal to the entire GDP, the entire national income. Now, if uh, debt is equal and the interest rate on debt that people have to pay is 4%, this means that if economies only grow at 1 or 2%, if they're growing today, all of the economic growth has to be to pay the financial sector. On what, interest payments? On interest alone, not mentioning the repayments of principal uh, to pay down the debt. So uh, this is uh, the phenomenon of debt deflation that uh, was discussed already in the 1930s. Uh, it's a, it's a, a phenomenon and it's inherent in the very mathematics of compound interest. In fact, this should be the focus of the economic curriculum. What? If you're teaching economics, you should begin with the relationship between finance and the economy, between the buildup of debt and the ability to pay. That should be the starting point if you realize that the problem, they're afraid to complain about working conditions because they could be uh, walked out the door. But he and also if, you, if they are fired, if, if they don't have a job, then all of a sudden the interest rates they pay on their credit cards go up to 29%. They're one month away from insolvency, one month away from homelessness. So Greenspan said, we've, we've hooked them, we've got them. And his view is that's the optimum state for workers. Why? Yeah, they can be because that's control. what he calls a free market. A free market is where the 1% get to smash the 99% without any ability of the 99% to fight back. A free market is where people do what they're told. And a free market is a mar the opposite of what Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and everybody else meant by a free market. Mm -hmm. The classical economists meant a market free from rentiers, free from landlords, free from banks, where everybody got what they deserved and produced. To, uh, but under Greenspan and modern economics, a market is free from government regulation, a free from throwing the bankers in jail when they commit crime, uh, free from uh, any kind of uh, policy making uh, by government, by labor unions, uh, by society, and uh, a, a, sh uh, it's a, a free market today is a centrally planned economy, but it's not planned by government. The planning sh is shifted out of government into the banks. So and Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street here in the, in the city in London. There can be no bigger failure as we sit here when you look at the actions of central bankers, when you come to talking about the real economy. Um, where next for them? Uh, it's very hard uh, to take people who have a tunnel vision and expand it because uh, they're just like uh, the old time Stalinists or religious sectarians. Uh, their minds are absolutely set, uh, set. There's no way you can have a reasonable argument uh, with the Federal Reserve because banks was economic fraud, junk mortgages. Uh, people say, uh, when Queen Elizabeth asked, why didn't anybody foresee it? 
The fact is, everybody foresaw that there was a crash. That's why they used the word junk mortgage. That's why they coined the term ninja, no income, no job, no assets. So all of the terminology uh, was widely used. The FBI in 2004 explained that there was the largest wave of financial bank fraud in history and uh, uh, George Bush uh, shifted uh, the investigators out of the FBI into national security, so nothing was done. Uh, when President Obama ran for election, he promised to write down mortgage debts to the real value of property, not the junk mortgages in excess of the value, and uh, that he was going to, uh, the terms that Congress set for the uh, bailout of the banks, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, was that uh, banks would rewrite the mortgages so that uh, the homeowners who uh, could not pay would pay exactly what the rental value of their property was. You and know, what, hap what happened? In practice, nothing was done. Uh, Tim Geithner, uh, who was a protege of uh, Robert Rubin, uh, was moved uh, as, on behalf of Citibank as uh, treasury, and uh, he bailed out the banks, leaving uh, all the debts in place, not writing them down. And uh, the problem there is if you don't write down the debts, then uh, banks stopped lending mortgages. They called in their credit card loans. Uh, credit card exposure in America went down by about $100 uh, billion, uh, from $1 trillion to about $900 trillion. Uh, the, the mortgages uh, were re written off. Uh, and so people uh, had to pay so much money I'm Michael Hudson. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Peking University. My focus is on uh, the distinction between the financial economy and uh, the real economy at large. I treat the financial sector and debt as an economic overhead, and my focus is on how society can deal with the debt and to explain why society cannot recover from the current depression until it uh, writes down the debts to what can be paid. Michael, we're uh, almost a decade on since 2008, and we sit here now uh, in the developed West, and we look at the global economy. Um, to um, even an untrained eye, things aren't still right, or, or, and haven't been right for some time. Where are we, and what's your view on why we're here? Well, we're in a permanent uh, debt deflation, to make it very brief. People think, uh, uh, in terms of business cycles as if uh, whenever things go down they automatically recover but every business recovery since World War II has taken place with a higher level of debt higher and higher and higher and finally by 2008 uh, the volume of debt was so high that it was absorbing all of the economic growth and uh, at that point the stock markets plunged, uh, especially when it became apparent that the business plan of the large boom of our time is how can society cope with the debt buildup the, that has occurred and is keeping the economy from recovering. So people listening to that must think, well, God, that is the obvious place to start. Why, don't, why doesn't every undergrad economics course start with that? Why doesn't it? Well, I taught money and banking at the New School uh, for social research in the 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, they wanted to uh, essentially teach uh, the Chicago School monetarism that uh, treats the whole economy as if it's barter. If you look at almost any economic textbook, all the way through the PhD, they treat the ec economy as being barter, and then they factor in money creation as if money creation uh, d directly affects uh, prices. Well, uh, this kind of tunnel vision led to uh, the following situation. To, it led, the people called the bubble economy the great moderation. And it was the great moderation because somehow uh, the banks were able to lend homeowners and companies and governments enough money to pay the interest. And uh, it, it, there was actually the largest increase in money creation in history since 2008. 
with no increase in price at all. So all the money creation has gone to buy stocks and bonds into the financial sector. So just let's define the great moderation. Which years would you put the great moderation between? Uh, about uh, 1995 to 2008. And it was a great moderation. And Greenspan explained it. He said it was moderate because labor didn't complain, because productivity was soaring and wage rates did not go up in the American economy. And he explained this because of what, uh, before the Senate committee, uh, by what he called the traumatized worker effect. He said, uh, workers are so deeply in debt that they're afraid to strike. 